Qur'an correcting the judgment mistakes of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. When Prophet Muhammad was engaged in the society and trying to change the society in which he lived, he, he had made some judge, mistakes in his judgment, lapses in his, in his judgment. And so immediately God would rectify that judgment. So not, as a less, not only as a lesson for Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, but for all of humanity, preserved for all of humanity that came thereafter. And one, quite, one very famous example of this is in the early days of Islam, and Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he is engaged in the Meccan society, which was, was full of so, all sorts of oppressive uh, uh, traditions, and amongst those is idol worship, etc. So Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, he sees this group of noble Meccan people, powerful and rich Meccan people. And he, in himself, in his judgment, he feels that by engaging these people, if he can con intellectually convince these people of the truth that he believes he's bringing to them, then he can have a tremendous impact on the rest of the community, on the rest of the, the, the society, because these people held the power of the, uh, everyone else around them. So while he is engaging in this conversation with them, this very uh, a heated debate with them, a young, frail, or I'm sorry, a frail, poor old man comes to the Prophet, peace be upon him. And the man, he goes to the Prophet and he says, Oh, oh Prophet of God, he had already accepted Islam accepted the belief in Islam, and he's coming to the Prophet, he says, teach me from the Qur'an. Teach me some verses from the Qur'an. And he's coming to the Prophet, while the Prophet is engaged in this, this very heated discussion with this very noble and rich and powerful group of people. And so the Prophet is, and of course this is an old man, I mean, he may not have the most sense of manners, but the man is really e eager to learn. And so he's coming, he says to the Prophet, you know, teach me some verses. The Prophet says, not right now. Um, don't you see what I'm, I, I'm engaged in this discussion? Don't you see what can come from this? Right? So the Prophet wasallam, he goes and he, he's, he continues to engage in this. And he's becoming angry with this, young, this old man. And so immediately, verses from the Quran, verses from God come to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and he says, Abasa wa tawalla. It's an entire chapter of the Quran about this situation. This is Abasa wa tawalla, anja wa la'ama, etc. But he says, you are engaged, you, are, you, you have kept yourself busy with this group of noble people and rich and powerful people thinking that you're going to change their lives. Thinking that you can change their mentality. Thinking that you can guide them. But guidance is not controlled by you, O Muhammad. Guidance is controlled by God, by myself. I'm the one who controls guidance. But you turn away from this man who is humble and sincere and he wants to learn and you turn away from him? So what God is teaching Muhammad and all of us today is that religion or that the sense, the, the, the sense of nobility is not by those who hold the most material wealth or power from what we can observe. But power and nobility comes from faith within. No matter how rich or how poor you are, that does not define your status in the sight of God. But rather your status is defined by your internal nature. How beautiful you are inside. And so this old man, albeit he was poor and not powerful at all, God says that your attention to him was more important because why? He was sincere in his desire to learn. Because he was poor, because of the customs you are accustomed to as a human being, a prophet, peace be upon him, I understand why you were doing this, but you need to understand Islam came to change these faculties. The understanding of nobility is not by how much wealth or power someone holds in this world, but how much wealth and power they hold within themselves. And so we see immediately the sense of respect and honor brought to anyone, no matter what social economic status that they have. So, furthermore, we see that the Prophet, peace be upon him, is being reminded that in order for you to attain a proper sense of, or a proper desire to help others, you must respect them first and foremost. You must respect them first and foremost. And in another verses of the Quran, God is speaking to Muhammad again, and he says to him, he says, listen, don't you remember you are an orphan? Because the Prophet, peace be upon him, he was an orphan. He did not have, his parents died at a very young age. So he was an orphan, yet I gave you shelter in the family that he provided him. And you are poor, and I, pro I provided for you. So then he says, And in regards to the poor orphan 
child. Do not disrespect them. And the one who's the beggar and the poor person, the one who's in need, do not turn them away. God is reminding us of our own infallibility, our own weaknesses as human beings, and of the, of the favors He has bestowed upon us. And so whatever we have in knowledge, in wealth, in sustenance, in power, in influence, it's not something that we have attained ourselves, but rather it's something given to us as a gift from our Lord. And that gift comes with a sense of responsibility as well. And that is to go to, the, to have respect and dignity for those around us. You know, that's the first step in the process of change. If we want to really feed and really help those in need, we must learn to respect them first and foremost. When we see that poor old man on the street begging for a few moments of, or a few coins so that he can feed himself or maybe some family members for the day, Oh, you know, he's just a drunkard. Or he's just some crazy guy, he's just got stuck on drugs. Whatever. That's the type of mentality we have about these people. Little do you know that that man was a Vietnam War veteran who gave sacrifices his life for your own freedom, for your ability to eat all you want. That man gave his life, and as a result, he gave his youth for you to live. He gave his youth, he didn't have the opportunity to go to Loyola University because he had to go sacrifice his youth for you to have your freedom. But no, he's just a poor old man who's drunk. Is drinking the problem the cause, or is it a cycle that is, that is engrossing his life? That's what we need to, need to think about. I see every day, every single day I go to work. I go in the morning, another th thought that we may have, these are just a bunch of lazy people, they don't want to work. We see it all throughout the media. These people, why should I pay for some lazy guy? Why should I pay for some lazy guy to feed his family? I, I, made my, I worked for myself, I lived the American dream, I made it, how come he can't make it? That's the type of mentality that we're developing within our young people. SubhanAllah. Glory be to God that we, we have this type of mentality. This man, I go in the morning every day, 5 in the morning, he's up on that same intersection asking for money. I leave at 6 p.m., he's the same man is there asking for money. If he had the opportunity to work, he would. But he doesn't have the opportunity. This is what we need to change within ourselves, particularly as young people, that we need to change our respect our understanding, our, 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 our sense of nobility. And once we're able to do that and have some level of respect for these people, then we'll care about them. And when we care about them, we'll have a sense of responsibility for them. So this is what we need to imbibe within ourselves, as young people, as anybody, to be honest with you. And I'll give you some stats and I'll conclude with this. A moment to reflect. Right now, according to whatever statistics I could find, I don't know how accurate they are. And I forget which year it was, I think it was 2008. Studies show that about 34.9 million Americans, 34.9 million, 35 million Americans have some level of food insecurity. They go to bed at night not knowing if they're going to have breakfast in the morning or not knowing if they're going to be able to eat tomorrow. 34.9 million people. You know what it was in 1999? 3.9 million. In the matter of 10 years, approximately 10 times as much people wake up in the morning not knowing if they're going to eat today. In our country, I'm not talking about Haiti, I'm not talking about Pakistan, I'm talking about America. The land of gold and the land of whatever. While we're eating this wonderful banquet, we should think about these people. And now, not only that, 20% of Americans' food goes to waste. One-fifth of our food goes to waste. And that one-fifth is equal to approximately $31 billion. And that is equal, that could feed 49 million people, the food that we waste. 49 million people. If we just made a concerted effort not to waste our food, 